I know that there are lots of more fun things you could be doing for your Halloween, but you chose to come to a lecture on early Jewish and Christian demonology and context. So props to you. So for the content, it will be difficult. I will be assuming kind of a baseline level of knowledge. Um, and I do have a slight content warning of the nature of the content is somewhat PG-13. So especially if someone's watching the recording later on and you have children in the vicinity, you might want to put on some uh, headphones. And so disclosures, of course, the ideas presented are my own and not Ratio Christie's. And if I cite sources, it doesn't necessarily mean that I agree with everything that is stated in them. And once again, content warning. So what is the motivation for my own personal research within ancient ideas about demonic powers? For me, it's about the, about the implications that beliefs about demons and, and dark supernatural powers can have to, to cause trauma within churches. <clears throat> And so in one study that was relatively recent, belief in demons amongst American young adults was a predictor of negative mental health outcomes. And so of course, as good scientists, we, we uh, know that correlation does not mean causation, but at the very least, there is some superficial relationship that can develop um, between beliefs about dark supernatural powers and psychological trauma. And in case studies that I've read, there seems to be a recurring theme of belief in demons as, as, as a very real threat to the trauma victim within every aspect of that person's life. And so for, for, the, for the trauma victim, it, it feels like that there are dark supernatural powers that are lurking around every single corner. And of course, you can understand how that could become very harmful to uh, someone. <clears throat> but the question that I pose as a historically minded person is what if most of what the trauma victims were, were told about what the Bible says about demons was actually wrong? Could beliefs about demons, rather than belief in the existence of demons, be the actual cause of the, uh, uh, of the trauma that the victims uh, experience? And so, of course, such a fine distinction cannot be captured within, within a, a psychological study like this. However, this is, the, this is my, uh, my hunch about the actual cause of psychological trauma that is related to belief in dark supernatural powers. And so my goal for tonight is to deconstruct harmful ideas about demons. And I will utilize the most advanced research and beliefs about demons within our ancient biblical literature, specifically with that aim, to deconstruct harmful ideas about supernatural evil that I believe have developed since the actual biblical period. And so before we can dive in and look at our actual data, we, we have to think carefully about our research uh, methodology. And so how do historians do research um, as, they, as they attempt to reconstruct the history of the religious beliefs of ancient people, including beliefs about dark supernatural powers? And so how historians do this is they examine the evidence from the time period that they are interested in looking at. And how historians do this, I kind of summarize it as data over dogma, is that they, they're looking at, at the meaning of texts and they are trying to ascertain it based upon the original historical, social, literary, and linguistic context. And so this is, the, this is known as the historical critical method. This is the standard within the academic field of biblical studies as practiced around the world. Um, however, people in church are often not, not aware of this more scientific way of looking at uh, biblical texts. <clears throat> and so as we apply the historical critical method, we must bear in mind that, that later church tradition, and frankly sometimes mythology, what, what later theologians say are not parts of the original context, and thus do not help us to, to reconstruct the, the history of religious beliefs in the biblical period. And so before I jump into talking about demons, we first have to define what are we talking about. So I think a very good general English definition is a, a demon is a noun. It is a malevolent spiritual, so a non-physical non being. And so in our English language, any malevolent spiritual being can be called a, a demon. However, the, the terminology in our ancient sources is far more complex and uh, nuanced. <coughs> And so in this talk, I will focus on the evil or unclean spirits Jesus encounters and that he casts out. And so a little bit of historical background. How do we understand ancient Jewish and early Christian beliefs about dark supernatural powers? 
And so if we are trying to situate Jesus and, um, and his earliest followers, and what did they think about dark supernatural powers, we must situate them within their original ancient Jewish um, milieu. <clears throat> and so between what, what modern Christians call the Old Testament or the Hebrew Bible and the New Testament in this intervening time period, um, this is what scholars call the Second Temple period, and it dates from approx approximately 550, 515 sorry, BCE to 70 CE, when the, when the Second Temple was uh, destroyed. And so in this intervening time period, this is what modern historians call Second Temple Judaism or early Judaism. And in this time period of approximately 300 BCE to uh, 200 CE, we have a lot of different types of Jewish texts that were produced. Um, most of them are, are not considered authoritative to modern Christian uh, churches. So, for example, the Dead Sea Scrolls, which were rediscovered back in the late 1940s and early 1950s, of course, those, those did not um, become sacred for Christian churches. The Pseudepigrapha, for the, for the Deuterocanon, they are, to my knowledge, at least somewhat authoritative in the Catholic tradition and not authoritative in the Protestant uh, and so that's why they are called Apocrypha in the Protestant uh, belief system. <clears throat> and so the like, take-home message here is that if we want to understand what did Jesus and his earliest followers think about demons, we must situate them within their, their ancient Jewish context. And so we have all this data preserved in this intervening time period. And so we, we, have to, we have to integrate this data to understand how did Jesus and his earliest followers conceptualize dark supernatural powers. And so I've kind of summarized what I want you to really take away tonight is three learning uh, objectives. So one is where do many early and Jewish Christian writers think demons came from? That's the question that a lot of modern Christians often assume that they, that they know the answer to that question, but as I, as I hope to show you later, the actual data is far more complicated. And so, what if I told you that many early Jewish and Christian writers thought demons originated from the hybrid giant offspring of fallen angels and human women prior to the, the flood? <clears throat> Another important question is what did many early Jewish and Christian writers think uh, demons are, are doing within the uh, present world? And so this might, might not be quite as surprising of a... Uh, of harming humans and leading them astray into moral evil. And finally, what were prevalent early Jewish and Christian expectations of the final defeat of dark supernatural powers at the end of, of time? And so here, I will suggest that, that during the, the present world, some evil spiritual beings have, have already been confined in the underworld, and that all of them will be punished and destroyed totally at the final judgment. And so I will jump right in. I guess this is a good time to kind of pause. Does anyone have any clarifying questions before we jump into our early Jewish data? No? Yes? By annihilated, do you mean like cease to exist or just that like they're banished to hell for eternity? Or what exactly does annihilated mean in this context? Like they are punished, but then they eventually cease to exist completely. Okay. <laughs> so once again, we are looking at our early... Jewish texts, so the, this time period of approximately 300 BCE to 200 CE, we are looking at texts that, that are under the, the, uh, the modern grouping of texts called the Pseudepigrapha. And so the kind of classical starting point for modern historians looking at, at the development of beliefs in dark supernatural powers is a text known to us as the Book of the Watchers. And this text, dated to approximately the turn of the 3rd century BCE, is part of what eventually became uh, part of what we now know as First Enoch. The Book of the Watchers is, is a retelling and expansion of the early chapters of Genesis, and it, and it explores the, the, uh, the origin of evil. And so within the Book of the Watchers, the story of the sons of God from Genesis 6, 1 through 4, is the explanation for the origin of evil spirits. And so since I know that most of us probably do not know Genesis 6, 1 through 4 by heart, I have pulled it up here. And basically what happens is that the quote-unquote sons of God see the daughters of man are attractive, and they take of them wives. 
And then after this, there are these mysterious figures called the Nephilim that are on the earth, and also afterward when the sons of God came in to the daughters of men, and then the human women bear children to the sons of God. And then following this mysterious event, humanity becomes very, very evil. And then humanity's evil is what prompts God to then send the great flood. <coughs> and so if you, if you have ever read Genesis 1 through 4, you will kind of get the idea that the description of the sons of God event in Genesis 6 is, is to us as a modern audience very vague. And Genesis 6 assumes that the audience knows context that is not uh, explicitly stated within the, the narrative. We can reconstruct as modern historians is that the phrase sons of God, or in ancient Hebrew, B'nai Ha'elohim, does consistently refer to supernatural beings within other texts in the Hebrew Bible. And so for one, I think, very clear example taken out of Psalm 89, for who in the skies can be compared to, to Yahweh, that is God's name, who among the sons of God is like Yahweh, a God greatly to be feared in the counsel of the holy ones, and awesome above all who are around him. And so here it's very clear that these sons of God, that they are not human. They are members of, uh, they are supernatural beings within God's divine court. And so, with this in mind, um, Genesis 6 describes how supernatural beings take human wives and then sire offspring. However, the connection to the Nephilim, and as well as how mankind becomes so evil, as well as its relationship to the flood, is not explicitly stated within Genesis 6. <clears throat> and so at this point, I will not attempt to, to read into Genesis 6 to ascertain what did the author of Genesis 6 think about this. I will skip forward to the Book of the Watchers. So, so uh, now we are at the turn of the 3rd century BCE. And I will just tell you that the individuals who composed the Book of the Watchers interpreted the descendants of the sons of God as giants. And the grandsons of the sons of God are, are equivalent to the Nephilim within Genesis 6. <clears throat> and so this is the expanded retelling of Genesis 6 in the Book of the Watchers. And so here, the, the sons of God, who are basically angels within, within God's heavenly court, are explicitly called watchers. And they say, come, let us choose for ourselves wives. They take human wives, the wives conceive from them and bear to them giants. And then the giants beget Nephilim, and then the Nephilim, um, the next generation, are the Eliud. And these giants have a very violent nature to them. And so these giants began to kill men and to devour them, and they also devour beasts and creeping things, and even to actually turn against one another to devour one, one another's flesh. And there is another aspect to the evil that the Watchers wreak within God's world. Another group of the Watchers corrupt humans with knowledge of what I kind of like to call metallurgy, magic, and makeup. And so one of the Watchers named Asael he leads another group of the fallen angels to, to teach human sorcery and charms, the making of swords of iron and weapons, as well as the arts of, of how to beautify oneself in order to seduce other people. <clears throat> and so because of what the Watchers teach humans, specifically um, the arts of beautification, then after that, the sons of men made, made them for themselves and for their daughters, and they transgressed, and they led the holy ones uh, astray. And so a summary of the events of the fall of the Watchers as they are recounted in the Book of the Watchers is that some of the Watchers, led, led, by, one of, led by one of the fallen angels named Asael, decide to rebel against God by revealing forbidden knowledge to, uh, to humans, metallurgy, magic, and makeup. Which then, corrupt, which then corrupts them. Subsequently, humans learn the art of seduction from the Watchers, and then a group of the Watchers, who are, who are led by one of their own named Shemyaza, then take human wives. The Watchers then sire monstrous giant offspring with the human women, and these giant offspring sow violence within the world. <coughs> 
And so how will God respond to the evil that the watchers have, have uh, wreaked into his world? <clears throat> and so there are three parts to, to God's uh, response. He orders one of his still loyal angels named Raphael to bind Asael in the underworld. And so here Asael, who had taught humans dark forbidden knowledge, is bound in the underworld and let him dwell there for an exceedingly long time. Oh, I just skipped it. And on the, the day of the great judgment, he'll be led away to the burning conflagration. Part two of God's response to the evil that the watchers have brought into his world is to order another one of his angels named Gabriel to instigate the giant offspring of the watchers to slay each other in a war of mutual destruction. And so basically all of the giants go to war against each other and they all kill each other. And part three of God's response to what the Watchers have, have done is he orders another one of his angels named Michael to bind Shemyaza and the other Watchers in the underworld until the final judgment. And so God tells Michael, bind Shemyaza and the others with him. Bind them in the valleys of the earth until, until the day of, of, of their judgment and consummation, until the everlasting judgment is consummated. Then they will be led away to the fiery abyss and to the torture and, and to the prison where they will be confined forever. But then look over here at this last very important line. And at the time of the judgment which I shall judge, they will perish for all generations. <clears throat> and so where do the evil spirits fit into the whole entire story? So after, after the violent giants go to war against each other and uh, kill each other, then now what happens is that these giants who were begotten by the spirits and flesh, then we'll call them evil spirits on the earth, for their dwelling will, will be on the earth. The spirits that have gone forth from the body of their flesh are evil spirits. For from humans they came into being, and from the holy watchers was the origin of their creation. Evil spirits they will be on the, on the earth, and evil spirits they will be called. And the spirits of the giants lead astray, do violence, make desolate, and attack, and wrestle, and hurl upon the earth, and cause illnesses. They eat nothing but, but abstain from food, and are thirsty and smite. These spirits will rise up against the sons of men, and against the women, for they have come forth from them. But will the evil spirits continue wreaking havoc within God's world forever? The answer is no, because thus they will make desolate until the day of the consummation of the great judgment. And so one day, <clears throat> the, the supernatural evil that has been wrought by the Watchers will eventually be curtailed at the final judgment. And so this is kind of a graphic that I made to describe all of the complicated things that are happening in the Book of the Watchers. And so the fallen angels teach humans dark knowledge, which, which then corrupts them. They also sire monstrous offspring with, with um, some of them. These monstrous offspring kill and devour man and beast. <clears throat> and then God's response to the evil that the Watchers ha have done is that some of the angels bind a bunch of the Watchers in the underworld. The Archangel Gabriel instigates giants to uh, slay each other. And then from the corpses of these, of these giants, evil spirits arise from the deceased giants and wander the earth to lead humans astray and to induce uh, sickness. And so <clears throat> what the Enochian... Uh, authors of the Book of the Watchers uh, expected to, to resolve the entire problem of all this evil and suffering within God's world is a final judgment at the end of, of time. And at that time, all, all supernatural evil, whether it be Watchers, Shemyaza, Asael, or their, or their uh, offspring, who are now evil spirits, will all be punished, but then completely wiped out once and for all at the final judgment. And so a, a question that I would like to raise is, well, do we have any other early Jewish texts within our time period that help to, to show us evidence of this conception of the origin of, ev of evil spirits as arising from the giant offspring of the Watchers? And by the phrasing of the question, you can probably guess the answer is yes. <laughs> so here is another ancient Jewish text. Um, this is Jubilees, which dates to approximately the mid-2nd century BCE, and so this is about 
probably like 50-ish years after the composition of the Book of the Watchers at the turn of the third century BCE. And Jubilees is an expanded retelling of Genesis and Exodus, which also takes up the story of the Watcher's sin as the origin of evil spirits. The writers of Jubilees expanded the content regarding the evil spirits beyond what we find within the Book of the Watchers. And so this is, this is the kind of additional content that we see within Jubilees that we did not see within the Book of the Watchers. And so this is after the flood, and there are impure demons began to mislead Noah's grandchildren to, to, to make them act foolishly and to destroy them. And so Noah basically prays to God, and he says, May your mercy be lifted over the children of your children, and may the wicked spirits not rule them in order to destroy them from the earth. And so this, this part, I think, is somewhat humorous because Noah says, and he's speaking to a God here because he's praying, he says, you know how your watchers, <laughs> so there's a little bit of tone of like blaming God here, you know how your watchers, the fathers of these spirits have acted during my lifetime. As, as for these spirits who have remained alive, shut them up and hold them captive in the place of judgment. May they not cause destruction among your servant sons, for they are depraved and were, created, and were created for the purpose of destroying. May they not rule the spirits of the living, for, for you alone know their punishment, and may they, may they not have power over the sons of the righteous. And so basically what Noah is asking God to do is to imprison all the evil spirits in the underworld because of the evil that they continue to, uh, to wreak. But before this, this can be done, another figure enters into the scene, someone named Mastima, who, who is the leader of the evil spirits. And he comes before God saying, Lord Creator, leave some of them before me. Let them listen to me and do everything that I tell them. Because, because if none of them is left for me, I shall not be able to exercise the authority of my will among humanity. And so Mastima and God reach this agreement that, um, that one-tenth of the evil spirits shall, shall be left active on the earth. However, nine-tenths shall descend to the place of, of judgment, i.e. to the underworld. And so all of the evil ones who were depraved, we imprisoned in the, in the place of judgment, while we left a, a tenth of them to exercise power on the earth before the Satan. And so this text is actually very important for the, for the development of of, of ideas about dark supernatural powers, because if you notice, this title Satan has been associated with Mastema, who is the leader of the evil spirits. <clears throat> and that is actually the, the, the first time that those two ideas become explicitly linked within early, early Jewish literature. And so following the, these events where most of the evil spirits are, are confined in the underworld, God does not, does not leave Noah and his descendants without any defenses against dark supernatural powers. And so Noah, he is, in, he is taught um, by angels about medicine so that he could cure them and thus counteract the diseases that are being wrought by the evil spirits. And so a little summary about evil spirits within Jubilees. The entire same story that we found in the Book of the Watchers with fallen angels, siring giant offspring who then become evil spirits after their deaths is told within Jubilees. And Jubilees adds the, the story of Mashima negotiating with God for one-tenth of the evil spirits to be allowed to roam the earth and to afflict and tempt humans while nine-tenths are imprisoned in the underworld. And finally, Noah receives angelic instruction in in how to counteract evil spirits, which he passes down to his descendants. And so once again, I will pose this question of, do we find any other evidence within other early Jewish texts um, showing and this idea about the origin of evil spirits as arising from the giant offspring of the Watchers? And once again, I will answer in the affirmative. <coughs> So this is another text, one that was more recently discovered by scholars amongst the Dead Sea Scrolls back in the 1950s. This is the Genesis Apocryphon and was most likely composed in the second century BCE, just like Jubilees. And because this text was discovered amongst the Dead Sea Scrolls, it is a very fragmentary text, meaning that the actual scroll um, has a lot of gaps in it whenever you are, you are trying to uh, read it. <coughs> 
And so this fragmentary text recounts a somewhat humorous exchange between Noah's parents regarding the, the, the circumstances of Noah's birth. And thankfully, in the, in the case um, of this particular text, the, the gaps in the story of the Genesis Apocryphon can be reconstructed on the basis of 1 Enoch 106 through 107 because a, a, the, the same story about Noah's birth and the, and the events that are recounted in the Genesis Apocryphon are also recounted in 1 Enoch 106 through 107. And so Noah's radiant birth is that here in, in our first Enoch 106, whenever Noah is born, he has this very radiant um, appearance, and he opens his eyes, and the house shone like the sun, and he stood up from the hands of the midwife, and he opened his mouth, and, then he, and he basically praises God. So it's a very somewhat pious, pious fiction story about how Noah is a born. <coughs> However, in the next scene, which we do find preserved in the Genesis uh, uh, Apocryphon, Noah's father is actually quite worried about the very radiant uh, appearance of his a child. And so Noah's father is thinking to himself, he's like, well, what if this child was actually com uh, conceived due to what the watchers are uh, currently doing? <clears throat> and so Noah's father approaches his a wife and actually confronts her and basically asks her, is this child actually my, my a child? And so her, her humorous response is basically, I swear to you by the Holy Great One, King of the heavens, that this seed is yours and this, con and this conception is from you. This fruit was planted by you and by no stranger or watcher or son of heaven. And then the, the uh, text kind of breaks off. So the only point that I want to make here is that this text that we find in the, in the Genesis Apocryphon assumes the whole entire Watcher story that I've been telling you about. And so Noah's father suspects that his wife has cheated on him with one of the Watchers because of Noah's radiant birth. And the narrative Lamech's assumption, Lamech is Noah's father, is that Noah is one of those dangerous giant offspring of the Watchers. <laughs> And so later in the narrative, and I do not show this portion for the sake of time, the paternity of Noah, he is confirmed as Lamech's child by a prophetic answer from Enoch, who is further up in the family tree, if you recall from Genesis. And so Enoch also prophesies that Noah, he will preserve the human race by building the ark. And so before I jump into the New Testament text, I do want to pause if anybody has any clarifying questions before I jump into Jesus and his earliest followers. Question. <laughs> um, so, in Luke, we're told that, um, in, that like angels or whatever are like spiritual and that humans have marriage, but angels don't have marriage, whatever. Right. So, how, how do watchers reproduce with humans? So, one thing that, uh, that uh, people always miss from that text, and I'm actually very, very glad that you asked the, the, this question, is that within Jesus' response, Jesus actually specifies that whenever people are resurrected, they are like the angels in heaven. But, but what happens to the watchers after they get punished? They get banished to the underworld, right? And so Jesus never actually claims that, that ontologically angels are not capable of siring offspring. What he does say is that angels that are, that are still within, quote-unquote, heaven, that they, that they do not. And so I think, that, I think that that explains that oddity and that problem that, that, that people have with the Watcher story. Anyone else before I jump into Jesus? No? Okay, we'll go in. So once again, we are looking at the New Testament. So this is the, the late first century CE. And we are attempting to situate Jesus and his earliest followers within their, their cultural context, which is ancient, ancient Judaism, which is a world far removed from, from our own usually Protestant and Catholic contexts. And so I will pose the, the, the question very directly of, of did early Christians share the, the Enochian explanation for the origin of evil spirits? And I will tell you that more and more specialists, so people who actually do research and, and, and who publish in this field, would answer yes to this question. And so we will first begin to survey the evidence in the stories of Jesus casting out evil spirits. 
And so this is a story from Luke's Gospel, chapter 8, where Jesus encounters this, this man who, who, who has many different demons that are said to be within his uh, body. And so whenever Jesus encounters this man, th this uh, man says, what have you to, to do with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? I beg you, do not torment me. For he had commanded the unclean spirit to come out of the man. For many a time it had seized him. He was kept under guard and bound with chains and shackles, but he would break the bonds and be driven by the demon into the, into the desert. And so after this, Jesus is, uh, sorry, the, the demons, they are begging Jesus not to command them to depart into the abyss. And then there is this large uh, herd of pigs that is feeding nearby. And so these demons are begging Jesus, well, at least, lo at least let us enter into these pigs. And so Jesus gives them permission, and then these, these demons come out of the man, enter the pigs, but then the herd rushes down this steep bank into a lake and then drowns. And so to us as modern people, this seems like, like a very disjointed and kind of weird story about why, why do the demons want to be within pigs? Why do once they enter them, they just kill them and then they're, they're gone? There, there are many gaps um, for us as modern readers. <coughs> And so I would suggest, in line with these two researchers, who I think are at the forefront of the field, um, that this story can be greatly illuminated if we situate it within the, the, the Watcher story that we looked at in the, in the Book of the Watchers and in Jubilees. And so the actual phrase of unclean spirit or impure demon occurs within Jubilees and also in, in Luke and also within some of our other Gospels. The, 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 the superhuman strength of a legion, that was the man who was um, demonized, him breaking off all like, those uh, chains, as well as the chaotic behavior of the pigs are, are akin to the violent tendencies of the giants from the, from the Book of the Watchers, as well as uh, Jubilees. Both Jubilees and the Gospel of Luke portray a, a um, an abyss in the underworld as a temporary place of confinement for evil spirits prior to the final judgment, which, which occurs at the end of, of, of a time. The Watcher story also explains why the evil spirits in the Gospel of Luke desire some form of embodiment, even pigs, rather, rather than losing their embodiment completely. And so the answer that I will suggest, and that has been um, put forward within to these research papers, is that the, the evil spirits want to regain the embodiment th that they lost when they were giants. And so another um, correlation between our, our data points in the Synoptic Gospels and in the Watcher's tradition is that the evil spirits Jesus encounters and then, and then proceeds to uh, cast out they are aware that they will be punished and eventually destroyed at the final judgment. And so within, uh, these are two different scenes about Jesus casting out evil spirits, one from the Gospel of Mark and another from the Gospel of Matthew. And so there, there are these men that are, um, that are afflicted by evil spirits. They ask Jesus, what have you to uh, do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? <clears throat> and then after this, Jesus proceeds to then cast them out. Um, and then in this, in this other scene, um, the, the demons crying out through the man, what have you to do with us, O Son of God? Have you come here to torment us before the time? And so especially this little phrase here of before the, the time, this implies that the demons are, are expecting some sort of future judgment where they will be tormented and then eventually wiped out completely. <clears throat> And so here, this is the, the Enochian explanation for the origin of evil spirits accounts for a lot of the, of the data points that we see within the, the Gospels. And so the last set of data that I want to look at this evening is kind of asking this question, is there any other evidence within our other New, New Testament writers that they were familiar with the story of the Watchers? And the answer is yes, <laughs> as you guys uh, may have guessed. Within 1 Peter, 2 Peter, and also in Jude, all very directly allude to the Watcher story. 
And so for the sake of time, I will only look at Jude and 1 Peter because the, the content in 2 Peter and Jude is largely the same. And so this is Jude, uh, verses 6 through 7. Jude only has one chapter. And so Jude is basically pontificating about what are the characteristics of egregiously bad people. Um, and so he is saying, and the angels who do not stay within their own position of, of authority, but left their proper dwelling, he, that is Jesus, has kept in eternal chains under gloomy darkness until the judgment of the great day, just as Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding cities, which likewise, that's a very important word here, uh, indulged in sexual immorality and pursued, literally in Greek, strange flesh. And they serve as an example by undergoing a punishment of eternal fire. And so what is happening here is that Jude is making a, a comparison between the behavior of the fallen angels and the men of Sodom within Genesis 19. And so the nature of the comparison is that Jude is, is referencing the story of how the angelic watchers pursue human sexual partners who were off limits to them, just like the men of Sodom sought to sexually abuse the angels sent to rescue Lot within Genesis 19. The, the binding of the fallen angels until the judgment of the great day in Jude is furthermore based on the binding of the watchers until the final judgment that we saw within first, you know, chapter 10. And so once again, the, the Enochian narrative about fallen angels and, and dark supernatural powers is being presumed by whoever is writing Jude. And finally, the last data point that I want to look at um, is that this is a very strange text in 1 Peter. Um, it recounts Christ's descent to the underworld, presumably between his crucifixion and his resurrection. And the text goes like this. He, that is Jesus, went and proclaimed to the spirits in prison because they formally did not obey when, when God's patience waited in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared prepared, in which a few, that is eight persons, were brought safely through water. And then he eventually goes on about uh, baptism and about how Jesus saves people, and then, and, and then the like, last part of this um, block of text is Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God with angels, authorities, and powers having been subjected to him. And so who are the spirits in, in prison in, in 1 Peter? The spirits in prison are the watchers from First Enoch, who did not obey because they had taken human wives and then corrupted humans with, with dark forbidden knowledge, right before the quote-unquote days of Noah. So recall the watchers teaching humans dark, dark arts is what causes humans to be evil, which then is the lead-in to the Great Flood story. And so the, uh, if this model of our textual data is as correct, whenever Jesus proclaimed to the spirits in, in prison, what did he proclaim to them? And so to answer this question, we need to, to turn back to the book of the Watchers to a scene where the Watchers, after their transgression, ask Enoch to, uh, to go before God and to ask for forgiveness for them as well as their giant offspring. And so <clears throat> once, once Enoch goes up to a God, he is before God in his heavenly throne room, Enoch comes back to the Watchers and the basic message is that your petition has been denied. And so he basically re restates the, the judgment and the sentence that has been pronounced against the Watchers and their giant offspring. And so he's basically saying, now, f from now on you, that is the Watchers, will not ascend into heaven for all the ages. And it has been decreed to, to bind you in bonds in the earth for all the days of eternity. Accordingly, you will not obtain your petition concerning them, that is, the, the giants, nor concerning yourselves. And so immediately after this, uh, this scene, um, whenever Enoch is delivering this message of, of, of a doom to the watchers, he then is whisked up into God's heavenly throne room. And so he is, he is flying up, he is lifted upward, and he is brought up to, to heaven, into God's inner sanctum. And so that, that series of, of events where there, there are the watchers, there is someone who is descending to them to, to deliver them a message prior to that figure then, then ascending back up into the heavenly realm 
is the parallel between what, what Enoch does in the Book of the Watchers and what Jesus is portrayed as doing in First Peter. And so what Jesus proclaims to the Watchers is that despite his death on the cross, which was apparently orchestrated by other su- evil supernatural beings, according to First Corinthians, the final judgment against them and their demonic offspring has not been thwarted. And so Jesus is portrayed as this Enoch-like figure who, who pronounces judgment on the Watchers after his crucifixion and, and prior to, to his ascension to, to heaven. And so, and so this uh, backstory helps to put into much sharper um, relief this, this statement about Jesus Christ who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God with angels, authorities, and powers having been made subject to him. <coughs> And so back to the learning objectives that I had alluded to in the beginning. Where do many early Jewish and Christian writers think demons came from? They originated from the hybrid giant offspring of the Watchers and and human women prior to the flood. What do many early Jewish and Christian writers think demons are doing within the uh, present world? They are afflicting humans and they are leading them, them astray to do evil. What were prevalent early Jewish and Christian expectations about the final defeat of malevolent evil spiritual forces at the end of time? Some evil spiritual beings have already been confined in the underworld, and all of them will be punished and totally destroyed at the final judgment. And so I want to, to now kind of take a step back and, 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 to, and to think about what is the historical significance of this relatively recent research on, on the history of, of dark supernatural powers. And so the first thing that I think is very apparent... A question? So I think that based on the evidence that Jesus and his earliest followers seem to presume the whole entire, like all of the events that happened within the, the Enochian stories, it really seems they just, they just presume that all those events are actually true. And that Jesus is stepping in and, and then he's casting out evil spirits. He is announcing that he will... Um, that the kingdom of, of God ha, 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 has arrived and that Satan's kingdom is being turned over, is that, recall that, that uh, earlier in the Enochian story, that after the, after the uh, flood happens, evil spirits are rampant, but there is not really much that like, people can like, do. And, and obviously people living in that time period knew that, the, that their world was still rampant with, with, with like, lots of, of, of uh, evil. And so whenever Jesus comes onto the scene and he's casting out dark supernatural powers and he's talking about God's kingdom coming, then people are kind of thinking, well, like, you know, this Jesus person, he is doing something that, that, that is greater than what we're seeing within the Enochian text. However, Jesus, he is presuming that the, that the events in those texts actually did happen, is what I would say. Um, so yeah, here, of course, as you are probably aware during the course of this talk that most of the ideas about demons within Western church contexts are completely foreign to what, to what the biblical texts actually show. And w- one benefit of appreciating the Enochian explanation about dark supernatural powers is that it also f- uh, distinguishes supernatural evil with, with more nuance. And so it is often assumed within modern Western Christianity that that demons are fallen angels. However, according to the, to the Enochian text, fallen angels, i.e. watchers, are not the same thing as the evil spirits or demons Jesus encounters in the uh, Gospels. <coughs> if we reconstruct early uh, Christian demonology as thoroughly conversant in the Enochic explanation for the origin of evil spirits, then that would situate early Christianity as, quote-unquote, an outgrowth of Enochic Judaism, as Dr. Bocaccini argued in his essay back in 2016. <clears throat> and so, as I wrap up, um, this is kind of more the taking a step back from a, from a historian's point of view and thinking about how does this actually affect modern people's lives. And so, I wanted to include a few um, thoughts about 
uh, dubious Western Christian ideas about demons that I, from a historical point of view, do not find evidence for. <coughs> and so one thing that I want to mention is that there is no textual evidence, at least that I have come across, from the Second Temple period or the New Testament that would suggest that demons can uh, read human thoughts or project thoughts into one's consciousness. And this seems to be a recurring theme within case studies that I read is that people who are traumatized by, by beliefs about dark supernatural powers, they are presuming that every single thought that is popping into their mind, that there are, there, that there are demons behind that. And I can tell you that, that historically, I, I do not find evidence for that belief within our, our Enochian sources or the New Testament for that matter. And even the, the individuals who quote unquote have demons, they are perceived as victims of evil, not individuals God hates within the uh, primary sources. And so another source of trauma to many people is that they have this belief or this expectation that if they accidentally summon a like demon, or if they accidentally pledge themselves to you know, Satan, that then now God will hate them. And it's actually surprising that people who are afflicted by, by dark supernatural powers, they are, they are people Jesus cares about. Um, <clears throat> there is no evidence in our literature that, any, that, that someone can, can commit oneself to a Satan or to demons against one's a will. And so this is another frequent theme that I've seen among people who are traumatized is that there's this fear of like, what if I accidentally pledge myself to like Satan? What if I accidentally do that? And it becomes like a very intrusive thought in their mind. And so within the Anaka explanation for, for our demons and for evil spirits, to become egregiously evil is one's own choice. And so within the, the, the Watcher story, humans become evil because they, they choose to become violent and to seduce other people and to participate within dark magic. Um, one little note that I have that I think is kind of funny is that sometimes you will hear what I think are rather silly things within among some modern Christian groups about how, you know, wearing makeup or, or your skirt length, that it is something that is demonic, or, or people will say that, and sometimes it's kind of half-joking, and some people, they, they actually think that, right? However, I would nuance what we see in the Book of the Watchers, because the arts of beautification are not condemned as such, they are, they are condemned because of what people use them to undo, and that is to lead people astray sexually. <clears throat> and finally, since I am a scientist as well as someone interested within history, I do not think it is responsible in the vast um, majority of cases, especially when we have scientific um, explanations for disease or a mental illness, I do not think that it is responsible for us to, uh, to um, credit disease or, or mental illness to, to demons in light of modern medical knowledge. And so my last little bit here is for individuals who are afflicted by some sort of anxiety related to dark supernatural powers, what are some ways you can um, to address this? And one that I think is very important is to set healthy boundaries with uh, people. People who are, who are usually traumatized this have usually been raised in an environment where demons seem to lurk behind every single corner um, to, and, and to overcome this, so one, one does have to somewhat remove oneself from the stressful uh, stimuli. And, then, and, and that could also include avoiding abusive church contexts where the fear of the devil and demons is used as a mechanism in, to control people's uh, behavior and also their uh, beliefs. A counterpoint is to connect with, with people who have similar experiences and people who are loving and open-minded. And for me, as a historically-minded person, I think that the most uh, efficacious way of handling demonic anxiety is, is to really work hard to educate oneself about the history of, of demonic beliefs and to critically evaluate statements about what the, what the biblical texts say and especially what they do not say about dark supernatural powers. And finally, in certain uh, extreme cases, it may be necessary to work with a mental health professional in order to, to, to uh, address the physiological responses to trauma that has arisen due to beliefs about dark supernatural powers. And so here are some of the, my recommended readings. Sorry, it's not super clear, but you can ask me about it afterward. These are some of the sources that I think are, are at the forefront of research within the Watcher's tradition and beliefs about demons during the Second Temple period, as well as uh, early Christianity. And finally, 
for my acknowledgments, I first want to acknowledge my friend, uh, Riley, who inspires all the research that I do, Rashio Christi Temu for hosting me, and finally for all of the researchers here who have contributed so much to our understanding about beliefs about dark supernatural powers in ancient Judaism and early Christianity. Thank you. And I will t take questions now. I have two quick notes. First, at 9.30, we're going to leave and go around the corner to the Chick-fil-A. Um, and I presume Jeshua will stick around for a little mm -hmm. bit to talk. So if you don't get a question in now, you can pester him later. The second thing is, your handout and uh, these slides are available for download at our tech site link. Just go down to View, Presentations, and Handouts, and then find today's date, which should be easy because it's Halloween. OK, go ahead. Yes. Um, <clears throat> This is kind of connected to the question Alex asked earlier about the degree of fictionalization in the Enochian tradition. If Jesus and his apostles assumed this tradition was true, like in a historical sense, then I, I have to wonder why wasn't it canonized with the rest of the early Christian uh, texts? Right, that is a very important historical question. If you want to get all of the all, all the dirty details, I will refer you to Dr. Uh, Annette Yoshiko Breed's Fallen Angels and the History of Judaism and Christianity. She has a great treatment of that, but I will answer your question. <laughs> Don't worry. <laughs> so we actually do see that for the first few, few, few centuries after Jesus, we actually have, do have several early church fathers that I know of. Irenaeus is one, and Tertullian is the other, who uh, both take the Enochian story very seriously. Um, Tertullian actually has like this treatise about women and about, uh, I think, like, like how they decorate themselves and, like, head coverings and stuff. And for a lot of, like, more patristics people, they're just, like, completely confused because they're like, where is he getting all this, right? But if we understand that Tertullian is, he is assuming the, the um, anarchic worldview, then a lot of his lack of comfort about women beautifying themselves comes into, it, it starts to make sense, right? Um, later on, um, certain people do not like Enoch. Um, one of those people being Saint Augustine, who was very influential both for the Catholic tradition as well for the Protestant tradition, and I think also for the Eastern Orthodox as well. Um, he was actually a former Manichaean, and the Manichaeans actually considered first Enoch to be canon for them. And so whenever St. Augustine eventually becomes a part of Western Christianity, he has a very sharp reaction against anything that is Enochian. And so ever since, that was one of the main reasons why the Enoch falls out of favor. It's a very prominent person really headed out for it. And then also just, you know, over time, people, the, the historical context of Christianity moves on, and most people are not Jewish anymore. Most of them are different forms of Gentiles, and they are approaching biblical texts within very, like, platonic categories about uh, supernatural beings. And so Enoch eventually kind of just falls off the wayside. Um, until modern scholars bring it back to life, back in the, usually in like the 19th century was when it really comes back into the, into the consciousness of Western historians. You mentioned that the, um, the giant offspring basically is typically like the unclean demons. One of the reasons they would have wanted to go back into the pigs was to be embodied. Yes. But right. then they drowned the pigs. Correct. And so my... Yes, so my explanation for that, and it is somewhat speculative, I've only seen two people like talk about this, and that's Dr. Lawrence Dukenbrook in his collection of essays, The Myth of Rebellious Angels, and his grad student Archie Wright um, in another essay in Enoch and the Synoptic Gospels, he uh, talks about it. And so the chaotic behavior of the pigs is kind of akin to, to the giant's very violent tendencies. And so but I think both Dr. Wright and Dr. Stukenbrook speculate that the reason why that the uh, giants are conceived of as so violent and so um, chaotic is that there is something inherently not compatible about, about a human mode of, of existence and, and a watcher's mode of, of, of existence. And so when those two modes of existence are like combined, there is a very chaotic, violent nature. And so the explanation for the pigs is that if they have this very violent, chaotic nature, maybe the like, host is, is not capable of like, containing all that. And so they just kind of go out of control, and then they just lose control and kill themselves, basically. But that is somewhat speculative. <laughs> I've only seen two, two of people actually talk about that. <laughs> yes. Uh, for Julian, um, do you know if you have a 
Could you repeat the question? I kind of couldn't hear it. Just moving back to the Drip Farmer question. Um, do you know if he wrote the treaties earlier in his life or later on? Because I think he was condemned as a heretic. So oh, for Tertullian, you think, right? Yeah, because later he like becomes part of the Mont Montanus group, and I think, yeah. Um, I'm not sure when in his life that he wrote it, um, but I, if I remember right, he's in, what, the third or fourth century? Can someone correct me? Because towards that time already, we are seeing that the, the, the Anakian texts are kind of falling out of, out of favor amongst a lot of churches. And so I, I think that one of them kind of like later on, I can't remember if it's Irenaeus or Tertullian, I think it's Tertullian that later in his life, he is kind of like, like, like noticing that, that most people don't consider the like Anakian text sacred anymore. And so he eventually kind of like says like, well, hey, I, I think I was wrong because God is leading the like church to recognize that first Enoch is not, so is not supposed to be canon. So yeah, <laughs> that's all that I'm aware of about him. <laughs> but <clears throat> anyone else? Mm -hmm. So you, uh, you quoted someone saying that, that we can interpret Christianity as a kind of outgrowth of Enochian Judaism. Yes. And it seems to be pretty clear that you all obviously have uh, Enoch uh, referenced in the cognitive environment. But are there other aspects of Enochian Judaism that are incorporated into uh, kind of Christianity? Because the sample size we have reference to the Watchers, uh, it's only Peter, uh, Jude, and Matthew. It doesn't include a lot of the Pauline corpus. Are there other like Enochian worldview suppositions? That's a great question to ask. That is a question that is at the very forefront of scholarship now. Actually, next year in 2025, the Enoch Seminar, who is a group of of the world's leading experts in all things related to, to Enoch, they are planning a research conference on that exact question. Is how do we situate Paul within Enochian Judaism? How, how do we situate Revelation within the Enochian text? And so that work is currently being done. I can tell you that, that from my own research, that the Enochian worldview, I think, permeates every single aspect of the New Testament. I would say that all of these synoptic gospels that their expectation and about Gentiles coming to know God, that is an Enochian um, theme that we find. And of course, it's also found within many other texts too. But you have this, this confluence of you are expecting Gentiles to be included. You have beliefs about the origin of evil spirits as arising from uh, fallen angels. I would argue that, there, that, that Jesus' ideas about the afterlife are thoroughly situated within Enochic Judaism. Not a lot of people have done that, that research, but people are starting to like, do it more. Um, and a great question about Paul. If you want to know about Paul and Enoch and Judaism, there is um, a couple of resources I can recommend for you after this, but people are starting to do that work. It's just at the very cutting edge right now. <clears throat> okay, it is 9.30, so let's thank Joshua for, for coming. And, um, yeah, so the MSC will be mad if we stay, so we're going to go straight out the door around the corner to the chick -fil -A.